Welcome to the Bergstrom Bunch podcast. My name is Kathy, and I am here today with my son, Danny. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you've had a very interesting last two weeks yeah. between traveling for work, and uh, then you got a little bug, and then you came back and had to uh, participate in a ninja event. You haven't done ninja in a while, so how was that <laughs> event for you? Oh, it was, it was pretty awesome. Yeah, I went from being in the mountains of uh, North Carolina, no Wi-Fi, no internet, nothing like that, and... It was good, very detoxing, and get a chance to just uh, breathe good mountain air, and then came back, and we had this awesome event with some inner city kids, and I haven't coached in ages. Yeah. Um, but it just reminded me how, how, I don't know, important that is, and mm-hmm. just some good opportunities to connect, and you could see the kids... It, used to pushing the boundaries and testing it and, sure. and and being the one to just kind of gently but firmly be there for them and, and encouraging them the whole time. It was, it was good. I haven't done that in a while. Yeah. Well, inner city kids, they come from a very different background. So their experiences are, they're going to they're gonna push boundaries. But then again, every kid in that age group pushes boundaries. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, do. just a little bit different. But you also had uh, your American Ninja Warrior run that was aired at the same time and it's so. funny because i haven't seen that run in a while and the last time i watched it um we had it ripped off something and it was super glitchy so that was the first time i've seen my my city finals run fully in good quality and it was, uh, it was a little skinnier back then yeah, yeah. a little skinnier back I'm then looking pretty clean. so now you now you have some new goals after watching well, i that, say right? I'm, I'm fighting heavyweight but you're in fighting reality, heavyweight I'm just fighting that's to not amazing be too heavyweight that's amazing but it's good times. okay I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to start using some of those types <laughs> of uh, analogies. Yep. Yeah. I'm just going heavyweight right now. Yeah, I know. Um, math moves math. <laughs> but then after um, after your run, you got to share some of your story with the kids. Yeah, yeah. I, was, uh, I haven't shared any of it in a while with the group, at least. I, I like to try to incorporate my experiences usually in as many conversations as possible. But, yeah. but with them, you know, I, I had a moment where, you know, they're in different set situations, and I didn't know what it was exactly. And, um, and I prayed about it and, and thought about it, and it was just neat to see just almost stepping back a little bit and just letting God use me and, and let his words flow. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, encourage him, kind of push him a little bit, um, but just be there. So that's cool. Okay. Awesome. Well, so a little while back, Caleb and I actually did a podcast and uh, and so some that were viewing it made some comments just uh, wondering when we were going to have one of our adopted kids mm-hmm. on the show. So for those who um, don't know you, they've yeah. never seen your run on Ninja Warrior, they don't know any of your backdrop at all whatsoever, let's just kind of go through that a little bit okay. so that they know, they, they know who Danny Bergstrom is and kind of uh, how he came to be. So let's start actually where you were born. Let's yeah, kind of go that far yeah. back. Well, I was born uh, as a Jose. As a Jose. <laughs> as a Jose back in the day uh, on the Galapagos <laughs> Islands. It's a crazy story. As it goes, I was born on a beach cabin on San Cristobal and to no electricity and one midwife and my birth father caught the me. The midwife. This, yeah, this crazy. I don't know if it was true, but it kind of adds a little allure to the to the reputation. But Yeah. Uh, yeah, adds Galapagos. a little spice to the story anyway. A little bit. <laughs> but we moved to the States really early on. I think we lived in Key Largo, all over. I had an older brother that was born in uh, Ecuador, yeah. and then a sister in Panama. And then we just moved all around the States. I honestly lost count of how many places we lived, mm. and I don't really remember too much of it. Yeah, yeah. Kind of a wild journey. Yeah. Well, and your mother was Ecuadorian, and your dad was American. Mm-hmm. And so how how did they meet? You know, that's a good question. I, don't, I, I think initially and, and i've seen some of the pictures and whatnot but he uh, he was a missionary and he did some pretty interesting things like he smuggled bibles into cuba and he seemed to have a passion for god but along the way he also had a a past with with doing a lot of drugs and so mm. i think at a certain point something changed in him it yeah. seems like um and he uh he started to kind of twist the gospel but he met my mother and she was very very young yeah she wasn't she what 15 is something like that yeah i think yeah. it was close to that age and, and then he uh, was what almost twice her age i think so yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a little yeah. crazy um but she lived on the side of a mountain uh, i remember i went back as a 12 year old to visit her her city and her parents still lived mm. there and they had one light bulb they ate guinea pigs and just a crazy crazy yeah. country lifestyle but they were they were happy and and they had a different they loved God, and they had a different understanding. It was interesting because whenever they became Christians, they gave up um, certain things because of actually the laws in Leviticus. They gave up like eating blood sausage and blood soup 
and a bunch of these different weird Ecuadorian. That sounds blood sausage. Yeah, blood I think it's more blood soup sounds than anything. Sounds almost cultic or something. Well, you, you live in the country, you don't waste anything. That's how I was raised, so I don't waste yeah, any of my no, food. Yeah, no, and I, I was going to say, you've always had a real interesting palate in the things always that you could a, I've eat. I've always so respected food. Let's yeah, say that. you've always, always, respected is a good word. Yeah. Respected is a good word. I do. Okay, well, and so even the fact that your dad at one point in time was a missionary puts kind of a twist on the journey that you've mm. made because um, that really impacted your view of God over the years. And I mean, I remember when I met you and your biological sister, Susie, initially um, at youth group, uh, taking you guys home one night. And uh, boy, I'm vaguely, I'm trying to reflect on some of those memories, but just walking into, like you guys weren't even sure you wanted to let me in the house (laughs) because you didn't know when either biological parent might show up. And I just remember that the curtains were um, basically sheets and the house was just trashed. And um, so, I mean, you know what, maybe you can identify a little bit more with some kids that that come from a certain type of background, maybe more than you realize sometimes, or maybe you do realize it. Well, it's funny, kind of like the the family in Ecuador that lived on the side of the mountain with one light bulb. We didn't really know because we were so sheltered. We didn't know that we had it so bad. <laughs> like we lived on cinder of blocks. All the memories and, you have, you remember the family with one light bulb. <laughs> I don't have a lot, but yeah, I, I, that was very distinct. Certain you could just, just see that single light bulb st- hanging, and it was it was not in the. There was a room that was for the guinea pigs where you would go because they had they call them cooies. In Ecuador, you'd, you'd go and they had this room full of small cages and massive cooies, and you'd go in there and. We'll get into all the details, oh. but they, yeah, they, I don't they know if our audience them is ready for that. And process them, let's say oh that. Oh my um, goodness! But when I grew up in Texas, so that's where we ended up settling in '99. Mm-hmm. Um, we moved out to Cut and Shoot, Texas, the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Um, well, not nowhere, but it was pretty country out there. And yes. Our house was on cinder blocks, and it got super hot in the summer. And my father didn't like to use the AC, so I'd lay against the cold drywall walls just sweating and mm. in the middle of the day i'd crawl underneath the house and lay with the dog and because it was a little bit cool underneath there so yeah. it was just super country had gardens my first job i think were hoeing the gardens and picking weeds mm. picking blueberries and uh and i remember i don't know i loved something about the working hard aspect i didn't like it at that time but sure. i remember identifying at some point when i was super young i have a couple of weird memories but one was Telling my birth mother that, hey, I'm, I'm, God made me to work. I'm going to work hard. And I was just picking weeds, but I, I recognized at that time I just enjoyed it. But you were it. picking weeds like you were on a mission. I guess so, <laughs> yeah. It was, it was just something I did. I just Whatever I did, I did it as, mm. as good as, as I could. And yeah, we split a lot of wood with axes and chopped a bunch of trees down. And for fun, we'd go and build little stick forts. And we were told that like if the school buses came around, that they'd get us and we were homeschooled so anytime oh, no. school buses you'd go and hide anytime it drove past our house so you developed a phobia of oh school scared buses. Of, i thought they'd open the door and just come out and <laughs> like they were gonna grab you and take you and put yeah. you in the institution Who with straight jacket never get or home. something <laughs> <laughs> public schools were yeah were a few. So, big yellow buses then you just run right i would run hide hide in the bushes so and at some point in time you had an incident with a, a grasshopper too right no, i don't know about that you uh, don't know about that i've blocked out the traumatic <laughs> you, memories the traumatic memory no, i used to we used to hunt them actually we'd get paid a quarter for uh no five cents for every grasshopper leg and so we take a grasshopper little, leg yeah we take our bb guns oh out there goodness. and i was a really good shot for years and I, the last memory I, a good memory i have about grasshoppers before it turned into a phobia was uh we collected probably a couple hundred and put them in this big pretzel jar and would shake it up and their juices would get flowing and oh, stuff. Oh, no. And would, well, but would take them out and feed them to the chickens. And I guess the only thing I can think is maybe I put my hand in there and one bit me because they would bite you. They got these big old pincers. We were talking about okay. grasshoppers that were, that were massive. Okay. Um, Texas style. Texas size grasshoppers. Texas style. Yeah, locusts. Where they less. say everything's bigger in Texas. Okay. <sighs> so anyways, now I have, well, I don't want to even admit now it. Now you're uh, trauma. Uh, yeah. Traumatized. A very irrational fear of it. Oh, yeah. 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 Which yeah. is amazing to me because there are so many other bugs that you'll play with. Or but then know. a grasshopper comes out and forget it. You're running. I'm yeah. trying to do the immersion therapy, but it hasn't oh, worked yet. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, so let's, let's kind of move on from there and um and i do want to kind of tap into just a little bit where where things kind of went south Mm. as far as your your biological parents because eventually you did come to our house so um so there was a time when they they split up and Mm -hmm. uh and then it just there was there was no provision there was not a lot of stability because we were under the assumption 
that there was a restraining order on our birth father because of an incident that went down, many incidents. Um, but our birth mother dropped it almost immediately. And so mm. we had this weird extended amount of time, I don't know, a couple months where he would show up randomly and we had changed the deadbolt and all the locks in the house. And then we'd see the deadbolt turning, and it was like she had given him keys. Mm. And, and at that point, my older brother had been legally emancipated, and that was a whole fiasco because they yes, said he was a runaway. I know, because yeah, he, he, was, he was at my house at yeah. the time, so I do remember. Okay. And, and so, yeah, so yeah, there's this moment where, where we're living with our mother. She works full time, so we're left at the house alone. No yeah. communication. We had no phones. Like, he had taken everything out of the house, so mm. we really couldn't, even if, if an accident happened, you know, there'd be no way to contact a 911 yeah. or anything like that. So. Yeah. So it was chaotic, and and we had been raised, you know, every day growing up. It was two hours of Bible time in the morning, singing hymns, mm-hmm. and and yet it was it was uh it was interesting because if we fell asleep or got distracted, he took it as us like disrespecting the Bible, mm-hmm. and so he would beat us for that. He'd just mm-hmm. take us out, and it was his way of uh, I don't know utilizing. I guess his position to enforce what he thought were the yeah. rules or whatnot. <clears throat> yeah. So if anything, it just it just taught us to like just be scared. So it was and more of like using the Bible as kind of a authoritarian approach to yeah, keeping you guys yeah. in line and things. And so, well, and that's where you see that when when the Word of God just becomes words on a page and it doesn't transform you on the inside, how everything can go south. So let's let's move on from there, though. Okay, because I just wanted to give you mm-hmm. know those tuning in a little bit of a backdrop and understanding as to. Um, why you and your siblings were removed and put in? Well, I do want to address care. one thing though, because I think something powerful that did come out of it was over the years. Um, actually, something you taught us and, and taught me was you know for the power of forgiveness. Because I didn't for years, I, I couldn't talk about it. First of all, and it wasn't something obviously I wasn't proud of, but which is very painful. Yeah. But along the way, I saw a pro- this almost an evolution of how I viewed it. Because it used to be that it was just a bad thing that God could use for good. And then it slowly changed from that to a tool for ministry. And then from that, um, not a badge of honor, but like this this painful mm. gift, this thing that I was allowed to go through that has now opened up a lot of opportunities. And so I was able to, at one point a couple years back, meet up with my birth father and offer him forgiveness. And it was a mm-hmm. super powerful moment. And it was kind of scary. And, and, and I had to set some ground rules and, Honestly, in the end, he kind of he broke some of those rules, so I had to stand firm. But but it was still amazing to be able yeah. to offer forgiveness to someone, and, and I definitely credit yeah, you. Yeah, and I was Jason. actually I was really proud of you for taking that step and being willing to get together with him when he wanted to get together with you because that was very challenging for yeah. you. Yeah. So let's um let's kind of fast forward yeah. a little bit from that portion of your childhood to then, um, the three of you, um, mm. moving into the foster care system. Yeah. And you and your biological sister went to one family and then David came to our house and so you were with that other family for like 10 months yeah and during that time during that time you got into football I did yeah so kind of you had a little bit of an incident happen a small one a small one I was playing defensive end it was second scrimmage of the year I'd never actually played a full football game but defensive end it came around the corner rushing the quarterback he drops back throws a pass a jump up to block it I could literally feel like it went by my fingertips. It felt like it was that close. And as I landed, I guess the running back had come back around. And he cut blocked me really low. But it was as I was landing and all my weight was on that one leg. So it just caused that sucker to just pop. Yeah. And uh, I just fell to the ground. And I so looked maybe, down and it was, you know. Maybe a little known fact is that Danny Bergstrom <sighs> actually has some metal yeah. in his body. Well, I did. Remember I did. And then. Oh, that's right. It didn't fuse well. So that's I ended right. up having to take it out. So it was a big ordeal. And. It really shook me. I have a couple moments in my life I can remember. I look back on, and those are the moments that either something really good happened and God used that, but unfortunately, usually it's the really bad things that happen that God used to open my eyes. Because at that point, I'd, I'd been hyped up by my coaches. I was a big kid, and I liked football, and they were already talking big things. And yeah. So I could see these dreams, and I didn't have much before that that I could really... Well, you did You did have quite an ego when I first met you. I yeah. still remember <laughs> you had quite an ego. So, you know, sometimes God has to allow certain things to happen to yeah. just take yeah. us down a notch and, you know, remind us who's well, I think actually at boss. At that point, I didn't, I didn't have any dreams growing up. Like, we weren't really... 
push to think about much. Yeah. Like we were told that God was going to come back before he went to college. We had oh. all these things. Yeah, yeah. Oh, a lot of predictions we, there. Very, okay. very much. So we, we didn't really, ex- I didn't expect to grow up really. It was just so like, either ca- God is going to come back or the big yellow school bus is going to get one you. One of those two. One of the other. going to take me down, two. you know. Okay. So now, now we're going to move from there to um, – to you and Susie yeah. coming to our house because that, that foster care home didn't work out for you guys. And uh, I remember in particular for you, you had, there was a lot of anger. Mm. You, uh, yeah, and you, you just, you really were very full of yourself at that time, but also very angry. And then because of what happened to your knee mm-hmm. um, and all of a sudden your football career was shattered, you really just kind of were lost in who you were. Yeah. And so I remember one day actually having a conversation with you and you like your face got red and you you just had like so much anger and I said, Danny, you need to go take it out on the bag. I don't know if you remember that when I sent you out to the barn uh, to get on the punching bag. Mm. You just had so much welled up in you. Well, and it was, was it was yeah. tough because that family that we lived with before, they were going to adopt us. That was in the, mm-hmm. that was in the works. And yeah. then just so happened things that went down and we moved out of there and uh and i blamed my older brother for that and we were sharing a room so it was just a lot of emotions yeah. and i think i was so stinted growing up i never was really allowed to express emotions other than just like fear and and maybe you know tears here or there and mm-hmm. um that just being in this, it yeah, that, that yeah being in this situation being safe to express it like it was it was overwhelming and i yeah. remember i still one of the not just fondest memories but realist memories was just that first day getting angry at my brother telling me i wanted to punch him or something like that and then going by the pool and just sitting down and crying and then jason <laughs> came over i don't know that's always a tender little guy emotional roller coaster yeah and jason just sat down and put an arm and just said uh, you know he'll always be there for me and then you as mm-hmm. well just giving me outlets i think yeah. I, I never was told i could be angry i thought you just couldn't be angry you shouldn't be angry but in reality yeah. if you find healthy ways to release it that can be really powerful yeah. Well, and I still remember when we first got your biological brother that he didn't want to be adopted. Mm. There was still a lot of pride in your previous last name, and he was intent on keeping the last name mm. even though he hated your dad. Yeah. And uh, at one point in time, him coming to us and saying, you know, there's no honor in that name, and mm. that he did want to be adopted, and he did want to change his name. And uh, and he was actually an adult when we mm. adopted him, uh, where you and Susie were just a few years younger you're 16. But anyway, so moving on from there, though, because God gave you a new dad mm. and he had certain a certain backdrop, which then he pulled you into. Yeah. yeah. And that was wrestling. And talk about that a little bit. I yeah. still remember, actually, when you and Susie came to the youth group and we talked about this, you were you were a bit bigger than so, yeah. dad at that time. Definitely. I mean, how much how many pounds I think as did a you freshman, say you had I was him? about six foot two, two fifteen. Two fifteen, and Dad was, was probably, probably one sixty five. Yeah. And you wrestling in the backyard, <clears throat> and I just remember you manhandling him. Although he held his own, but you manhandling him, and me watching that, thinking, "This kid is going to break <laughs> something in him." And so I was really concerned. That was actually the night that I drove you and Susie home. So anyway. well, it was funny because I found out recently that he, I, had, I took him down first, I think. And then, because the whole thing was you'd have all the youth group guys in a circle. You probably can't do this anymore. But uh, all the youth group guys in a circle, and then he'd be in the middle. And it was just kind of a dog fight. You'd just go in there, first takedown yeah. wins. And I didn't know anything about wrestling, but it kind of came naturally to me. And, and anyone who knows Dad would be having a hard <laughs> time wrapping their mind around <laughs> the idea that he would be in a dog fight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was, it was good. It was good. <laughs> they don't, they yeah. don't know the wrestling side of him. But anyway, so let's Well, hold on, hold on, because this, okay, this is ahead. important. Go this ahead. Go ahead. Oh, he... So I he, I took him down and then immediately he turned around and double legged me and put me right on my butt. Uh, but I found out recently that was he said that was the hardest anyone ever had taken him down <laughs> ever before. I, I, oh I no yeah, idea. I, I think thought you he, almost knocked the wind yeah, out of him. Yeah. He was very unfazed, at least is what he appeared to. But I think I rung his bell a bit, <laughs> so <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> that's kind of how that journey started, and then he just took me to honestly like his technique and things he taught me in the drive took me to take it to states and do pretty well with it so yeah it yeah times. that's amazing yeah. so that yeah and for you that was a journey that you made that really was so impactful because you finally did have some goals and dreams yeah and thoughts for the future and some direction as to where that would take you as well it's interesting though i was pondering this the other day i was talking i uh, actually so um where i went at in north carolina um was this co- college appalachia state or appalachian state i think it was and a lot of my high school wrestling buddies ended up wrestling in there for college. Mm, and okay. and I moved schools um, from my, my senior year, but 
I had an opportunity to wrestle in college, and and actually, you and Dad challenged me not to and to and to pursue something else. And I and I was really tough for a long time to to move on from that because I kind of I held some resentment that oh, I missed out on my opportunity or this or that. But I look back and like even though I you know I was eighteen at that time, there were still so many lessons that like and you know Caleb grew up with you guys, so him mm-hmm. and those that grew up with you all had these years of of instilling good habits and. Mm-hmm. and like a, a, a yeah, and we're gonna and we're gonna move into that. So, but let's uh, first. I just what accomplishments did you have with wrestling? That was a good you time. Took, yeah. yeah. So got some you, hardware. That's your senior year, we moved you to Florida. Yeah. And that's what brought you from Texas to Florida. Yeah. And then you took third, third in the state. Yeah. For wrestling so. yeah. in Florida. Yeah, that was a challenging time as well for I think for all of us because it was either dad or I that were driving here like every six weeks from yeah. Texas and that's like a twenty hour drive. Or no, maybe seventeen. Times. I don't know. I can't remember now. It's been so long since I've driven it, thankfully. But <laughs> um but traveling that much to see you wrestle or visit Kylie who was also here and then of course Brittany was here, um, came later. But uh but anyway, but you you really had a good run of it. And okay. then and then Hmm. Uh, and then and then you kind of went on a journey that was kind of deviated from the values that uh, that you had adopted yeah, in our yeah. house had and so and I, I do want to touch on that quite a bit because hmm. I think that uh, especially as people hear our story and they know where we've come from that they are of the assumption that oh all of our kids once they moved out of our home were just adopted mm. everything that we had instilled in them, and yet your journey was very different, and you you, you did some things. So yeah, let's, yeah. let's kind of talk about that. It's still a journey, honestly, to be honest. That like it's it's a daily journey, and it's something that you can. Ins- but it was a journey that actually kind of disengaged you from the family for a time. Yeah, I came to a point where I realized that you know certain habits and things they would put me outside of, of the definition of a Bergstrom and, and yet I chose to do that. And so mm-hmm. I acknowledged and I wasn't ignorant of it. I didn't try to straddle the fence. When I decided to go do what I wanted to do, I fully embraced it. And, uh, and at first it was fun, you know, a lot of good times, good memories, this or that. Well, if I could remember them, you know, but, yeah. but in the end it just led to zero dollars in my bank account and, and ended up actually getting in some legal trouble and, and being at a point finally where, you know, I, I couldn't fix myself, and and yeah. and I remember just sitting literally in a jail cell. Just, and I don't stress very often. I'm someone who's so like. You <laughs> I know, do even, remember you sitting in a jail cell. I remember getting well, I didn't, phone calls. I didn't call you. I didn't call you because I knew I, if I called you, you wouldn't bail me out. No, I yeah. I know. So <laughs> but I, didn't, I remember I didn't getting a call phone call. You. I didn't not call from you. jail, but yeah. Uh, but I remember sitting in that jail cell, and uh, and it was a Sunday, and and I was supposed to go to work on the Monday, and. Uh, and my best friend at the time was supposed to bail me out, but he, he was a no-show. And so I was pretty confident, okay, that's going to get sorted out, this and that. And and yet he never showed up. And so mm. it was a football day, and normally I love football, and I watch it. And, but I started to stress, and I couldn't even watch football. I was getting sick to my stomach, and and I couldn't go to sleep. And I had this really stinky cellmate, and it was just a nasty environment. And I remember just laying there and just realizing, like, I've ruined my life. Mm-hmm. and And being at this low point and not... And knowing that God was there somewhere, and I didn't want him to get me out. I didn't want to, like, I knew I couldn't just ask him, like, a genie to come save me, mm-hmm. but I just wanted peace. And I remember just, like, being broken finally and just calling out to him and asking him just to, to meet me there, just to just give me peace, help me fall asleep. Um, and then I passed out, and a couple hours later, it just so happened that my buddy ended up bailing me out, and I didn't lose my job, but... A um, bunch of other things ended up happening mm-hmm. from there, and it just uh, that moment I can pin in, I just you know, left those habits behind and and been moving forward since then. But uh, yeah, yeah, that was one of those pivotal moments. Well, I, yeah, I remember sure. receiving a lot of random phone calls from you during that time while you were gone. <laughs> Oftentimes, it was within the context of mom. I did something last night. I don't even remember what drug it may have been. And like you had some sort of side effects the next day and you wanted Perhaps. wanted to know from me what, what you could do to <laughs> alleviate those side well, effects. Well, I think we shared a similar past. And so, uh, <laughs> so you know, you got to go to your mother for wisdom sometimes. Oh, my goodness. Or, or I think more you would call me because you needed a verbal spanking I, a lot yeah, of the time. Yeah, con- so. my, my guilt was there. And yeah. I just missed my family. And, I, and that was a tough one because I wanted them to accept me. And, and I have sometimes a hard time 
when I explain our family dynamic to people who don't, I won't say don't have high standards, but that don't um, have a family that, that challenges them in certain ways mm-hmm. like that, because they, they always tell me, oh, can't they just accept you? Can't they just love you for who you are? And But then I have to remind them, them that I'm adopted, that, that I was given this family. I was given a lineage of people that love God, that live for God, that hold themselves to a higher standard. And that's different than, I think, just being... I don't know. It's tough to explain it, but it's something that... Well, I think I think when you love someone and you choose to accept the journey that they're on, that doesn't mean that if they become toxic that you maintain any sort of close relationship yeah. or bring them into an environment where that toxicity is going to breed. And so it's kind of like when you have... I mean, I have family members that there was always one that you knew if this family member showed up, they were going to get so drunk and yeah. belligerent that... Uh, stuff was going to go down and for us as kids it was kind of entertaining to mm. see the adults you know <laughs> engage in the, in some of those altercations but uh, for the rest of the family it was always a wonder okay what's going to happen when this person shows up this time and so anyway just to say that it wasn't well, but i do want to address though that when we say high standards i think a lot of people immediately or might perceive that that means that you think you're better than someone else if you mm. can address like adhere to that but that's not ever been the case, at least with you guys. Like, you have high standards, but, um, you know, it's almost like a Christian. We don't hold the world to God's standards necessarily because if you go out and challenge someone to live like God and they don't know God, yeah. then, you know, that's that's why there's so many people hurt by the church. Um, but if you're a Bergstrom, if you're someone who, you know, has been given this family, like, this is a different expectation. And yeah. it's been a challenge. It's honestly something that, like, pushes me in a lot of ways and I think about that and it's difficult at times but it's also it brings the best out of me when I find myself living that way yeah Uh, and I've found myself on the other side too many times and I don't like how that is so well don't you think that it's true that when you have something that you're engaged in that you feel fulfilled at and either you're investing in someone else or it's an investment in yourself that it really helps you to to kind of still pursue that best version of you even if it's not a perfect version or the version you would like to see um, it's still something that's forward motion. Like for right now, right yeah. now you're engaged in, an, in yet another activity, which is still along the lines kind of of wrestling, but yeah. it was fun for me to go watch you. Uh, okay, I have a bad memory. I'm going to forget this if I don't say okay, it right now. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> I just want to say, though, go um, ahead. let me see if I can articulate it properly. Um, I, I think, so I was homeschooled, and I, I like to slander homeschoolers a lot, uh, just because <laughs> I think it's pretty funny. Because they're but, easy to slander. But uh, I think sometimes homeschoolers or people like that, they find their identity in just being like the homeschooler, like this is mm. me, I'm, I'm different. And you guys never taught us that, hey, you're going back to the idea of like elitist or like, hey, you're a Bergstrom, so you're better than other people. It was, hey, let's find your identity or your gifts. Let's find what God's talent made you talented in, both physically with sports or mm-hmm. academically and or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, and, and use that as the outlet to show God to this world. Like use your skills and, and not just let's cuddle in here and stay together, but let's hone, you know, the yeah. gifts that God's given you. And that was always super empowering and being able to, you know, kind of, you, know, you always say use it as a mirror, like you reflect, you know, not just what you've given us, but yeah. what God's given us through you to us. So it's, it's, it's uh, I think it's way more empowering than just having a, an awesome last name or this or that, but being able to use the gifts that, that God's given us. Okay, so before we move on to uh, your most recent activity, I do want to kind of rewind and mm. uh, just dive in just a little bit on a comment you made about uh, Dad and I discouraging you to go to college for wrestling. Mm. And... Uh, and at that juncture, because you were already starting to move into the wild side of life, yeah, uh, we just knew that if you went off to college with no accountability, with no family around you, that it would just take you on a, on a journey that actually was similar to the journey that you did make, but you might have a bit of college debt or <laughs> mm-hmm. who knows what else yeah. if you had been in that environment. So that is largely why I just don't want anybody listening to think, man, these people are against college or something. No, no, Because no. we are absolutely well, like not. Like I said, I think that but, was at that time, that was the most, yeah, probably the best but it decision. But was, it was just more where you were at at that stage of life that that environment just would not have been good for you. And so anyway, but... Uh, rags to riches here you mm. are you're you own your own business I call riches yeah well yeah well riches <laughs> no is doing, relative what, I, doing what i love and, yeah. and honestly like if, if i had gone to college i missed i would have probably missed out on wyoming because i ended up spending a couple years there and yeah that's working true. on my uncle's ranch and falling yeah. in love with just working with my hands and that's right. and i thought college was what i was planning on but like you said ended up doing a lot of different things i've had yeah gosh i lost count of how many jobs i've had i've done a lot of funny stuff um but yeah now in the last couple of years i've been 
doing this little uh, rig building job where I just mm-hmm. build ninja rigs and, and well, that's okay. So let's rewind to how you got into that because we didn't really touch on ninja too much, other mm-hmm. than talking about it at the very beginning. But at at one point in time. You did, as you said, you finally had that aha moment, if you will, that yeah. jail cell moment, that, uh, which many of us do have, those jail cell moments, I'll tell you. Maybe, a lot of different maybe there's a reason cells, why jail but, exists, yeah. but anyway, but then... Metaphor, I've been in a lot of yeah. me- metaphorical jail cells. <laughs> metaphorical jails. Yeah. Um, and literal jails. And literal jails. <laughs> jails. One, just one. Um, but anyway, <laughs> but then you finally did make a, a decision that you wanted to come back here and re-engage in being part of the family. Actually, you stayed with us mm. when you first came back. You and there's one had stipulation a, I remember. Had a buddy. Yeah. Do you remember what it was? It was uh, no more cigarettes because that was one of the yes. hardest things to kick. So, yeah. Yeah. So, or drugs of any form for yeah. that matter. Yeah. yeah. You you had to go t- cold turkey if you're going to come back home, but then you did, and uh, you kind of you know, little by little got your life back on a better track, and then of course we started uh, the ninja in the backyard. Yeah. And uh, you gradually became. More and more a part of that. Well, that was always a test on me, but yeah, you know, it was always a test on I did you. The stress but tests. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but then you were inspired when you saw Dad compete. Yeah, that was a good. And you lost actually a lot of weight after Dad competed. How much weight did you lose before you were uh, on the they show? They said on the show sixty pounds, maybe a little shy of that, probably mm. fifty pounds. But still, so. that's a considerable yeah, amount. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, for I've some really good for some people, that's a third of their body weight. Yeah, yeah, so, or half their body so I mean, weight, that's yeah. yeah. So that's pretty significant. I've, I've tried so many different. I don't want to say yo-yo diets, but I've definitely my favorite things have been keto and then carnivore. So mm. I did I did those for a bit and yeah, had a lot of success. You seem to lose weight pretty quick on both. Very of those. quick, yeah. Once you cut out carbs and all that fun stuff, uh, all the fun all stuff, the fun which stuff. Which is why most people. What don't I learned cut is you just carbs. gotta stop loving food, and that was, that was a tough reality <laughs> one for me, and just uh, chew slower. Uh. So. <laughs> it's very difficult for a young man that has a, a romance with food. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've had a long relationship with food. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah. Anyway, so, okay, so you did you did Ninja, which is actually it was, what, during 2020, right, when we yeah. had to shut down for a time that we had all these parents that because they didn't have the gym to go to wanted Ninja rigs in their backyard. Yeah. And so yeah. then it just became big business for you for a time. Yeah. It honestly, it, it taught me a lot. It's been a challenge in the business side to, to learn how to – handle money like that and and how to uh bid things appropriately so i don't end up biting the bullet yeah um and i've learned a lot and when we actually jason had me help build the gym so yeah learned a lot through that the physics of how to build these things properly to keep them strong and safe oh and i know and you've kept him on the phone many a day is well, asking him oh, yeah. yeah asking yeah. him how I, how to do this how to I'd do that probably owe him some consultation stakes but <laughs> consultation <day>. stakes yeah. <laughs> something so. we'll wait till you wait till you hit the big time financially <laughs> and then we'll collect on all that investment but it's been fun and, and being able to um you know set my own schedule like with so i train jiu-jitsu now so yeah before some of the bigger tournaments i, I kind of maybe whittled down my work a little bit so that i can get in there and train hard um but being able to hire actually one of my buddies from Jiu Jitsu and mm-hmm. and starting to provide him with an income, it's been really amazing to see. And you've done some work for your, the Jiu Jitsu yeah, gym yeah, too, right? Some, yeah, built a rock wall and then a gate and some other stuff over but there. Then you've so. also done some remodel projects. So your your skill set is advanced beyond just ninja rigs. Yeah, yeah. You do home projects, and actually, right now in Florida, that's big business because yeah. everybody is building yeah. and renovating. What's well, cool? I get the very first like long-term memories I have with Jason was remodeling a church in Texas, doing all the fascia boards, some really hard, hot work. The only time I've ever seen him drink a soda was in that job because it was so hot, we'd get a Sprite at lunch, mm. and that little Sprite would keep us going. Yeah. Uh, but my little, job was... A little sugar fix there, A little too. bit, a little yeah. bit. Um, but I had this menial job. I was filling in holes all day with just putty and, and gotta being start on somewhere. Ladder. Yeah, and gotta start uh, somewhere. they really bonded us, and I was able to pick up on his skills and learn some of the tricks, and he taught mm-hmm. me a lot of good techniques and yeah. ways to do things smart and quick and efficient and safe sometimes. Um, and uh, yeah. I think that a lot of kids that have dads that invest in them in some capacity don't realize how great they have it, hmm. you know, because there are so many – so many out there that are either too busy or um or yeah. absent and so to actually have have a parent that invests in you not just with building but i mean you have you know dads who are computer savvy or you know just their area of expertise investing in in their children and it sounds kind of awesome. like i don't want to say a, a boomer take but it sounds older to say it but like i don't know something about hard work 
a boomer take. Yeah, you know, it's an old, <laughs> old, old timey thing. But like the hard work is something that not, I think a lot of people, you know, will tolerate it, but not a lot of people actually enjoy it. And I think Jason really emphasized that. And, oh yeah, yeah. And being yeah. like those hot, long, hot days out there where you're he's, just he's always dying been a hard and, worker. and yeah, moving mm -hmm. and. And it's something I find a lot of pride in, and if I don't sweat, you know, I feel like I'm not working hard enough. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's always about getting out there and getting it done. And you know, as I've progressed along the way, learned you know, pick up better tools and better tricks of the trade and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, I really do enjoy the hard work. Yeah, fantastic. And Dad and I are Dad and I are really proud of the journey you've made. I mean, there have mm. been bumps and bruises along the way, and certainly it's it's been a roller coaster ride and uh, a little bit of an adventure having yeah. Danny in our lives for sure. But uh, anyway, as we wrap it up here, is there anything else that you want to share that maybe about yeah. your journey or anything no, you have going on right now that's you know? Yeah, I think it's. I mean, without you guys, I definitely know. And you guys aren't necessarily just a safety net, but you've you're more just that. If anything, you kind of push the opposite of a safety net. But you're people that I can always go back to for advice and, and wisdom. And, and you'll say what needs to be said. And sometimes, you know, honestly, God will tell you things that, like, I made a decision years ago never to lie to you guys, even if it did something terrible. You know, it's like, why why would I lie to someone who's so close to God because God talks to her and tells her things? <laughs> and, and so that's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> That's I had that inside me. connection. Uh, but but overall, <laughs> just uh, it's a, it's been a journey that you guys have set such a good role model for. And then my siblings too. They, they've all. It was tough when I first came back from my wild journey because I I didn't I felt really disconnected. Yeah. And 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 you had missed out on a lot of. I stuff. did. Yeah. I mean, and memories too. I have whitewater a, I have a, rafting trip. That, I have a terrible yeah, memory. I have I've hit my head too many times. Yes, and, and you have hit your head too many times. And so making up for lost time, even now. <laughs> one, just, one time in particular, do you want to share that as no, we close? Man, no man, that was a good time. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, we were in actually we we're heading to Wyoming and uh, we were in San Antonio. No, I had driven. I had oh, driven. Oh, yeah, right, yeah. Right, driven from, from Lake Houston. Conroe to mm -hmm. San Antonio. You and a few of your siblings. And my uncle had this old, old, old longboard from California. Mm -hmm. And I took Caleb and my cousin, and we went up there to the top of this hill, this massive mm -hmm. hill. And I took my shirt off because I didn't want to, you know, ruin my shirt if something happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had Caleb filming on this potato camera at the very bottom. And uh, gosh, I just sent it. I just kind of lean forward and that's like the last memory i can remember and yes and and caleb and your cousin were what 12 years old yeah right something about there. something like that and what did they tell you before uh, you sent it i don't remember i do because <laughs> everybody came running to the house afterwards <laughs> they had told you and danny put on a helmet oh, and you did not want to wear a helmet well we were but at the yes. very top and uh, the video is somewhere <laughs> out there and i got the speed wobble and I was a wrestler, so I tried to roll out of it, but I ended up just headbutting the earth. Yes. And just. It's a good thing you have a hard head, for sure. Maybe yeah. too hard in certain uh, ways, but uh, you know, I remember you were pretty you were pretty out of it. A little bit. So, yeah. So, the Uncle Dwayne the, Uncle think, Dwayne was an EMT at the time, so he and he had us he had us check you out in certain ways, and then I ended up taking you to the ER that night. I just know that the drive, the 20-something hour drive to Wyoming seemed like it took a second because I don't really because remember Because you don't it. remember any of it, yes. <laughs> no. I remember sitting in the ER for quite a while before they did a CAT scan. I think the, the, the first thing I remember after that was just trout. Uh, there was an ad for trout on the TV, and I was just talking about fish, and you were so upset, like, why are you talking about fish? Because I kept saying it over and over <laughs> and over. But, I was so <laughs> upset. Well, I had driven three hours to get you guys there, and then I still had to drive yeah, home three hours. Night. And I remember saying, I remember mm. saying, Danny, if you don't have a concussion, I think I'm going to give you one myself because mm. I was so so upset yeah. so of course they did the cat scan you didn't have a concussion but anyway yeah. okay so with that i'm going to wrap this up and just Hi. say thank you to everyone for joining us today uh, you can find us on spotify apple podcast and youtube and as always please subscribe